Like I said multiple times in my character studies and episode talks the overall theme of revenge is how bad the influence of a mother can be on their children. And we have four big mother figures even five if you count Louise's mother Penelope Ellis in that are very much interesting. Because Penelope only channels Victoria and her mother I will focus on these four, Marion Harper, Victoria's mother and Victoria herself. Cause her bad influence on the life of her three children cannot be denied. Though Conrad had a little bit to do with this, too. Then we have Cara Clark who is most notable for her absence in her daughter's life. But I think it would be interesting to explore how she could have influenced Amanda's life in a bad or maybe even good way. Last but not least we have Stevie Grayson, who repeats the absent mother theme from Amanda's childhood, but tries to make it up with Jack now that he is an adult. Let's start with the two worst mother figures this show has to offer, Marion Harper and Victoria Grayson. Pity's not a quality you've taught me. You vindictive bitch. Oh, I learned from the best. For me the flashback episode in season 2 was intriguing only because of these two. I enjoyed this story because it reveals a lot about Victoria's trust issues and how she became who she is now. I remember in season 1 when Daniel confronts her on behalf of Emily. I think maybe even for the first time he questions how she became like this. What happened to you to make you feel so threatened all the time? Or maybe you don't know why you hate so much, maybe it's just who you are. And I think with the story they show us in flashback to underline that this actually has happened and is not another of Victoria's lies we see the reason. Her mother was the first person who used and mistreated her. In a perverse version of Cinderella Marion Harper is jealous of her beautiful teenage daughter. Who seems to get more attention from her lovers than Marion herself. Or is she the reason that you come by at all? You are a sick woman, you know that? Goodbye, Marion. No. You drove a wedge between me and every man I ever loved. Of course she blames the teenage girl than seeing the ugly truth. Those men just pursue a relationship with her to see Victoria and maybe even seek to try molesting her if they find the right moment. A little glimpse of what your mama must have looked like when she was around your age. What are you now, 20? 25? 15. But instead of protecting her daughter and throwing that men out she kills one of these men before he can leave her alone. Get out of my way! Thomas, please! Get out of my way! You just couldn't control yourself, could you? Batting your eyelashes like a little whore. It serves you right for choosing a pedophile over your own daughter. I can understand that Marion stands under much pressure because she has to care for a teenage girl as a single mom. But other women do this and they have a good relationship with their children. I mean why cannot she find a job and be contempt with what she got? I think the greedy character traits and putting a luxurious lifestyle first is something Victoria inherited from her mother. Like her survival instinct, in season 4 Daniel blames Conrad for this mantra. But I think it is Victoria, too who thinks survival is everything. Maybe that is the one thing in which both Conrad and Victoria agreed. Because surviving is all that matters, just like Dad said. By the way her choice of men seems also to be influenced by her mother. Cause in a smaller scale Marion obviously searched for a man who can provide enough to get her and Victoria a careless life. I'm not marrying you Marion, that is not what this is. You can't leave me, how are we gonna survive? And nobody promised to take care of you and plus the kid. So by getting richer and more powerful men into her web Victoria is in some kind fulfilling her mother's legacy. Victoria also took a toxic relationship pattern from the scars her mother gave her. She is falling for men that treats her badly. First that art forger who seems to love her but also uses her knowledge about art to acquire high class customers. Then of course Conrad who mistreats her badly in the aftermath of her affair with David Clark. Using her to frame her former lover is just a very sick move. Pascal was not better either cause he used Victoria not only to hurt Conrad and show him who is the bigger man in town. When Conrad and Daniel come after him to pin him down he is using Victoria as some kind of bargain and reinsurance. Then we have David who at first looks like the first man with which Vicky can break this pattern. But in season 4 we see that in fact she only traded one bad man for another. Were you this cruel 20 years ago and I just missed it? Cause David seems to have become as cruel as Conrad was. At least when he only deals with her. Their love and passion turned into hatred and disgust. On both sides. The same turn her marriage with Conrad took. So you can say it is not alone the men's fault. Cause Victoria is the constant in all these failed relationships. This isn't a marriage. And I'm not sure it ever was. Clearly not for you. I remember the way you used to look at David Clark. You have never not once looked at me like that. Not before and certainly not after. You have never given me reason to. Well, perhaps I should count myself as lucky. I mean, look what happened to him. Another tragic trait of this unhealthy mother and daughter dynamic was that Victoria obviously does everything to please her mother. 
I mean, she even takes the blame for her murder. Take the gun. We'll tell the police that he attacked us. That you shot him to protect me. Yet her mother is never contempt or even acknowledges what her daughter sacrifices for her. She just wants more. In her relationship with Conrad, she seems a little bit to repeat this pattern. Cause in the flashbacks it looks as if she is trying to do everything to convince Conrad that she will stay loyal at his side. Even though their marriage seems to be more like a trap after they went back together. Another thing, she repeats the pattern of becoming a mother at a young age and being not ready for a child. And like Marion who throws Victoria out and does not give a damn about her. Victoria is leaving her son Patrick behind. Even worse when he comes back in search of his roots she is not welcoming him but sends Frank to pay him off. Patrick here was of age, he came in search for his mother, and our general fact told him Frank paid him that tidy sum to disappear. I wasn't the one who sent him. That'd be your dear old mum. This shows how deep her fear runs being reminded of her past failures and losing control over her life. It's true. To sum this up, Victoria had a traumatic adolescence, an experience she shares with Amanda Clark. Cause the troubled teenager had to learn to defend herself as well as Victoria. I am sure after her mother throw her out because she feared Victoria would steal her boyfriend she had to life on the street before she found a job and a new home. I do not know but I think the social support system of the 70s had not nearly those high standards like today. In retrospect it were those bad experiences young Vicky had life through that made her who she is in the show. Yes after all that she made her own choices. But the really bad ones go back to her trust issues and fear of losing everything she has achieved under those very hard circumstances. So it is no wonder that she mistrusts everyone who comes from outside. You really don't trust her, do you? Trust is the one luxury I cannot afford. And thinks everyone is out there to take away her children. Maybe it was even something Conrad threatened her with when she wanted to leave him. Anyway, in a twisted way, Victoria might think she was a better mother than her own and did everything for her children. Because that is what she told herself. So her motivations may even be the same as the ones of Marion Harper. Cause she wants to build a good life for her and her daughter, too. As crazy as it sounds I think her goal with all this men was not just to have fun with them and getting money. She fought for the survival of her little family with Victoria. Yes she did it not in the right way and put her needs always over the ones of her daughter. But it must have been hard being a single mother in the 70s. I mean her lover and father of Vicky told her to get rid of her when she turned to him. There must have been much desperation on her side, too. So as bad as these two ladies were for their children I can understand what made them so cold and hard-hearted. Both women went through much and were treated badly by their partners. Maybe it would have been better if both never had have children in the first place. And they would have been better off alone than being in miserable relationships. Amanda's mother and David's wife is a tough character. I see so much potential here. But as she was written this mother figure was maybe the biggest deception of season 2 if not the whole show. At first like all viewers I was thrilled when they told us that Amanda's mother might be still alive. Because I know David's deepest secret. The wife he had before we met. The daughter died in 1990. What did she say? That they killed my mother too. No. Your mother's alive. I really thought she would stick around and we would find out more about Amanda's happy childhood before it got destroyed by the Graysons. Yes we found out more about her childhood but not in the way I and the audience was expecting. And it only got worse than better. I mean how much trauma can you give the lead of the show? It is like they overdoing it here. But let's begin with the harmless parts of their backstory. Kind of sweet but not that much original was that David was Kara's first love and they met in high school. He was my high school sweetheart. Can you believe that? You never know when or how you'll meet your true love. He was only my first love. There's a difference. Fits also if you think about how their marriage failed. She just was too young and did not know enough about herself. Maybe she even did not know that she was sick or those episodes started after giving birth to Amanda and were triggered by some kind of natal depression. Anyway it is pretty much obvious how this marriage went down. Cos Kara could not take care of herself and even less of a child. And David could not be around 24-7 to watch after his wife and protect his little daughter. So they made the decision to tell Amanda who obviously already knew that her mother was very sick that her mother died. You need to tell her I died. It'll be better for her if she thinks I'm gone. This really shows my dilemma with her backstory. How could David keep such a secret from his daughter and his future wife Victoria? Okay that they did not know what to do when she was four or five I can understand. But before David was arrested she was eight. So why did he not find a way to tell her? I mean he obviously visited his wife in hospital. At least once to tell her he wanted a divorce so he could marry Victoria. I assume he checked on her and he surely paid for her treatment. 
So why did he not take the time to tell Amanda about her and made her visit her mother again? I mean this is a very important relationship and figure in Amanda's life. Or did he think he could just switch mother figures with her? It's a good age. Not a worry in the world. Well, she's growing up without a mom. It's a worry. And last I checked, you were working on a plan to change that with Victoria. <laughs> I mean their fight at the beach must have told him that his daughter still cared about her mom and did not want to have a surrogate for her. What's she doing here? I don't like her, she hates me! Why would you say that? You don't even know her yet. No, tell her to go away now! I'm not gonna do that, Amanda. I love her. And you will too. No, she's not my mom! Or was he afraid that the truth about his relationship with Victoria and the truth about her real mother was just too much for this kid? In my opinion it is right what Emily said in season 4, David is a coward. You taught me to be strong and brave, but you're a coward. He maybe not runs away from problems, but he definitely is show of confrontation. But back to Kara, they do not make it clear what her psychiatric diagnosis is. With these characters they seldom do. Anyway from her medication it seems to be that she had psychophrenic episodes. He had a bottle of pills on him, fluvenazine, an antipsychotic, one of the strongest. I think the pills belong to my mother. My mother. She was your age when... She had her first break, wasn't she? Maybe this got undetected after Amanda's birth and her natal depressions turned into a psychosis. Or she developed it later. Anyway her attempt to drown herself and her daughter Amanda seems not to have been her first breakdown. I think she went back and forth like most psychiatric patients. I guess she was committed by David several times and they agreed that he and Amanda would visit her on a regular basis. Which must have been a traumatic experience. Hence her blackouts about her mother. Seems that Emily totally blocked out this part of her past. Especially since she was that young. I think our memories not go back farther than to the time we were four or five years old. Exactly the age Amanda had when her mother tried to drown her. Which was also the last nail into the coffin of her relationship with David. Astonishing that he still seemed committed to her and that it was her idea to tell Amanda her mother died. Shows how helpless David must have felt that he agreed to this really bad idea from a crazy person like his wife. Anyway what strikes me is that they did not gave us a good explanation why she did not once reached out to Amanda. It seems as if she totally forgot about her. I get that while Amanda was living a happy life with her single dad and bringing that crazy woman back into her life had maybe caused more harm than good that she did not tried. But what was when David told her he wanted to marry Victoria? Was she so full of calm medication that she did accept that David wanted to cut her out of her daughter's life completely? And replace her with a total stranger to Amanda? What about the whole scandal and trial around her husband's crimes? If she really believed those lies why did she not try to get Amanda back? Sure it would have been a hell of a fight cause she clearly was declared incompetent to take care of herself and a child. But what about when she built herself a life with Gordon Murphy? Yes she was on the run and a psychopathic killer might not be the best stepfather. But did she not have any relatives she could have called on her daughter's behalf? I mean why did she not try to make Amanda's life a little easier? It seems to me as if she totally denied not only her responsibility for her own child but the whole existence of Amanda. In fact ill or not this makes her truly to the most bad mother in revenge. And what I really hate about these few episodes we have with her in season 2. It is not even the acting cause Jennifer Jason Lee did really the best with what the writers gave her. Her scene with Fomanda really kills it. I'll just say my piece and go. Despite all the odds against you, you survived. And you've grown into an amazing, amazing young woman. You're strong. You're independent. You're just everything that I could ever have hoped for you to be. And here we come to the problem. In season 4 it was thrilling the suspense and all those questions when and how Emily would reveal herself to her father because she could do it with no danger of being exposed to the Graysons. Conrad was dead and Victoria already knew her secret. Done. In season 2 Fomanda was still alive and pretended to be Amanda. Emily's mission was not nearly over and she could not risk to expose herself to an unstable person like a psychiatric patient. I mean in rage her mother could have blown everything by telling the Graysons about Emily's secret mission to destroy their lives in revenge for David. So we had zero chance of a real honest conversation between Emily and Kara. I must admit Emily Van Camp and Jennifer Jason Lee made the best of it. Their coded conversion on the beach in which you can feel Emily's pain and Kara's regret was so good. But it was just not enough. Sometimes when I draw, I forget where you are. You, do you draw? Yeah. I'm sorry. If you don't want to talk about it. No, no, it's fine. Please don't tell them that I'm telling you this. I don't need any more bad blood with the Graysons. Don't worry, I'm very good with secrets. And as far as the Graysons go, 
They'll get what's coming to them. People like that always do. And it really makes me angry how they misused this storyline again. In the season 1 finale I really thought wow what a potential this story has. What a play. And even in the first few episodes of season 2. When Emily was on the hunt for information about her mother I really thought this could have gone in a real cool direction. Maybe even after the big reveal about Kara being a psychotic mess who hooked up with the murder of her first husband and father of her child I thought this could have led to something interesting. But no they again just used a crazy person to stir up trouble for Emily and fill some blankets in the plot. Just like they did with Tyler and Fomander when they first were introduced. The problem is Tyler and Fomander were not that close to little Amanda. For God's sake Kara is her mother. After her father David she should have been the most important figure in her life. And they just turned her into this caricature. With Fomanda they established in the flashbacks a real connection between the two girls. All they did in Kara's flashbacks was to destroy her reputation. I mean instead of thinking about her daughter and the last time she saw her. She is thinking back on happy times she had with her second husband. What is wrong with this woman? I get that she does not dream about happy times with David and the bad thoughts she must have had about him all these years do not go away in one minute. She tells Emily that she did not believe those lies they told about David. Have you read Treadwell's book? I still can't accept that David was capable of such terrible things. But I think she had enough reasons to hate him. He was the one who took her daughter away from her and put her into a psychiatric ward. Yes, in flashback it looks as if she was okay with all this and it was her idea to disappear completely out of Amanda's life. But what else could she have done? She saw how traumatic the visits were for Amanda. Seeing her mother fixated and screaming. And she surely hated David for leaving Amanda alone and in foster care. In her twisted mind this was obviously his fault cause he was the one who destroyed their family. First by trying to get remarried with the wife of his boss and then by risking it all with the move of whether financing terrorism or getting framed for it. So I get that she was in need for a new protector. But why drove she right back to the Hamptons when she heard about Formunder's accident and not before? And do not tell me that she is a crazy person and we do not know what goes on in their minds. They are spontaneous and just do crazy things. Cause that is exactly the problem I have with the writers of Kara's plotline. They only recur to her craziness when it serves them story-wise. I mean in no time Jack and Fomander welcome her to the family and even let her hold baby Carl. Even though Emily told Fomander about the murder-suicide she remembered and that this is the reason why Kara Clark is a danger for Fomander's infant boy. Anyway it is really hard for me to talk about Kara Clark without disappoint and resentment. It must mirror Emily's feelings when she finally says goodbye to her mother. She even asked her if she has to say anything substantial to her daughter and the only reply she gets is this. Just tell her I wish I could have been a better mother. I agree this sums up her regret and the relationship of the two very much. But what if Kara did not leave? What if Kara Clark became a recurring character or even a series regular? Because we have not that much information on her backstory and it is hard to figure out what her motivations are I think this might be the more interesting question for her. So I will tell you some of my thoughts how Kara could have been put to better use for the story in season 2. First I would have loved to see her coming back in the last season. I mean like Victoria and David who in some kind sort things out she could have had a real moment with her former husband. At least he is the father of her only child. So why did she not feel the need to talk with him again after he had come back? She must have heard about it since it was the biggest story in all media. They could have squeezed a little confrontation in and maybe even give us some flashbacks to the dysfunctional marriage. I know the focus was on David and Victoria. But it would not harm if the two had become the chance to talk things through. Even just for the sake to have a last big fight. My first choice would have been bringing her back in significant moments. Either when Emily was in need of an ally or just needed someone to support her. Or when something special happened like her engagement or weddings. I mean she married twice and neither her father nor her mother were present. Sure the marriage with Daniel was fake and she could not explain why Kara should attend this. But her wedding with Jack in the season's finale. I really hoped that Kara Clark would have been the surprise guest. Anyway there certainly were different angles to approach here. First Emily could have told her the secret about her true identity and they could have had a real bittersweet moment. This actually could have been her departure gift. Letting her mother know that everything would be fine in the future and they would have the chance to meet again. Okay Kara's conversation with Fomander served that purpose but it was fake. So this would have felt real and gave Kara the opportunity to come back anytime. I mean her daughter died and she even did not attend her funeral. Why could Emily not try to find her with Charlotte? 
Till David came back at the end of season 3 I was always hoping that they would bring Kara back. Even just for one or two episodes. Knowing about Emily's revenge ender she could have been an ally. I mean Fomander was not less unsteady and she got to help, too. And as I said in Tyler's character study most mental patients get along quite well when they take their medication on regular basis. Most outbreaks are due to discontinues. She might not have delivered insights on the David Clark conspiracy or the Graysons. But she could have helped behind the scenes. At the beginning when Aiden found her we get to learn that Gordon Murphy taught her a few things and she was really good in protecting herself. Aiden can agree. It might even have reached the level Takeda showed Fomanda when she was in Japan. Anyway Kara has enough reasons to hate the Graysons. We see in her last episode when she is going after them and even tries to execute them that she has the same anger and fury in her as Amanda. So in my opinion she was good to go with Amanda's revenge ender. Yeah she would have been as much as a wild card as Fomanda was in season 1. But who cares when she keeps her mouth shout and helps getting the job done. I mean it also could have been thrilling not to know if she would confront the Graysons and accidentally spill Emily's secret. Season 2 could have taken a whole another turn if Kara became a regular and even a part of Emily's revenge ender. And even season 3 would have been more fun with her. I mean all the commentaries and unwanted advice she could have given to Emily during her fake relationship with Daniel and her actual love affair with Aiden. Her mother's reaction to that would have been fun to watch. And since Nolan is such a fun guy the dynamic between Emily's best friend and surrogate family and her actual mother would have been just hilarious. Imagine him being jealous of how close their relationship had become or how uncanny it is having her real mother around and pretending to be an orphan still. Anyway for me this was the most big mistake the writers could make, having such an important figure like her mother coming back into Amanda's life without knowing what to do with her. I mean they had multiple times the chance to stop this. Emily could have found out that she died later in an accident or was killed off as a louse end. They even could have gone for making her wild goose chase just a total waste of time. Because Gordon Murphy finished the job and there was nothing to discover but her grave. Like Aiden did with his sister Colleen who he found in an anonymous mass grave. Besides giving our heroine even more trauma after all those flashbacks with David and more scars because she found her mother and only realized that she is the same state as she was when Kara left. The family. Kara Clark did not contribute anything to the story or gave us new facts about the conspiracy. So besides traumatizing Amanda even more this plotline gave us nothing but heartbreak and regret. In retrospect it looks as if Stevie Grayson was just written to restore Revenge's reputation for motherhood. And of course to gave Amanda a better role model than her own mother. After all Stevie becomes her mother-in-law. And surely stays around to make sure that Amanda does not make her son Jack unhappy. I assume she will move from LA to the Hamptons and spoil her only grandchild. But again let's start with her backstory because her soapy baggage really did not tell us that her character would go in this direction in the last season. In traditional soap fashion Stevie pops up as the first wife who stirs up trouble for the Graysons. I'm the first Mrs. Grayson. Well you know what they say, nothing beats the original. I think so too. What I did not expect through it is a common trope in soap opera that she has a secret child. And since we have not that much characters left with an uncertain family history it had to be Jack. It's not really any of your business. Actually it is. Why? Because Jack, I'm your mother. Again this was superficially a real bad choice. Cause it just adds more trauma to a character who already has enough baggage. In his childhood Jack lost his mother because she left their father who was an alcoholic. Later he loses his first crush and best friend Amanda under traumatic circumstances for both children. Then as an adult he loses nearly all of his family. First his father who is by the way the only character who dies of natural causes in revenge. He gets a heart attack. Then he uses his only connection to Amanda, her dog Sammy. But season 2 is the worst cause he is losing both his beloved wife and brother due to the Graysons. So when Stevie turned up and told him she was his mother I was as crazy as it sounds happy for Jack. Cause for one time he got some of his family back. And I really loved where this relationship evolved to till season 4. And since we had the same story with Victoria's son Patrick it was not that unlikely and crazy as it appears to be. I mean two alcoholics ending up in an affair and forgetting to use birth control. Why not? The only strange thing here is again this soapy everybody is a relative of everybody. This web you could form is really fun. First we have Amanda in the center of the story. She is David Clark's daughter and almost became Victoria's stepdaughter but also was Victoria's daughter-in-law. Married to her son Daniel who almost became her stepbrother. 
who is the half-brother of Charlotte Clark, who is actually her half-sister and was her sister-in-law. Ready for Jack, he is the half-brother of Declan Porter and the son of Stevie Grayson who was the first wife of Conrad Grayson, which makes him in some kind a stepbrother to both Daniel and Charlotte who dated his half-brother Declan and almost became the mother of his child, and even the stepson of Victoria Grayson, the second wife of Conrad Grayson. Does your head already spin? I must admit this crazy backstory who came out of nowhere was for me not that much interesting in season 3. I was more intrigued by the flashback with David Clark and Stevie trying to help Emily. I just love those old-fashioned lawyer stories by John Grisham and those movies in which the lawyer is the big hero and corrects grave injustice. But this is revenge so Stevie had to fail. I wanted to believe her, but that's when I noticed the gin on her breath. A few days later I found out that she'd been disbarred for drinking. I actually liked her baggage with this drinking problem. I know it is a trope that you drown your bad conscience and problems in alcohol. But it is also a true cliché. Failing David in the past gives her a strong motivation to help Emily, too. And because Victoria stole her husband she must have feel not that much less hatred towards her than Emily does. Oh, I'm sorry you see me that way. Especially since the last time we spoke, you were on my husband's arm. You won, Victoria. Isn't that enough? Though I guess you're still trying to take what I already have. Hmm. So I was deceived that she did not play a bigger role in season 3 and in taking down the Graysons. I get that Jack wants to protect her from the bad influence they Graysons and the memories of the past have for Stevie as a recovering alcoholic. When I lived here, I couldn't exist without a drink in my hand. But now... I'm sober coming up on 20 years. The Hamptons are full of triggers for me. The greatest being Conrad and Victoria. But why not empower her by giving her an active role in Emily's revenge ender? It is a pattern we see with Jack and his girlfriend Margot, too. I thought you'd try to make him pay, and since I've lost everyone who's ever tried, I, I didn't want to lose you, too. He is just too anxious to lose someone he loves, again. After all he has lost a total natural reaction. But both Margot and Stevie could have ignored his fear and just pulled through. I mean both women were introduced as fierce and truth seeker. Margot is a journalist with sense for a good story and Stevie is a lawyer with a great moral compass and passion for justice. So why do they give up this easily? Is Emily the only one with that unstoppable drive? Anyway her appearance in season 3 was kept short because she felt back into old habits and Jack got her out of town before Victoria could destroy his mother completely. So her strongest season was the last one. In which she stand up for her son Jack. I admit at first it was annoying how she talked against Emily and played mother bear to prevent Jack from doing something stupid. I see how you work Emily. You clearly manipulated me. I draw the line at my son. Mom, my enough! Son. You are a train wreck, Emily. Jack will not be your collateral damage again. Like admitting he killed a FBI agent and covered the murder up because she was also the daughter of a mobster and a mole. But Stevie has a point. Jack in some kind repeats the pattern David had with Victoria. Though he is not that blind, he sees how wrong Emily's actions were in the past. But she always gives her a pass because of his feelings for her. He just cannot shake her. So her analogy with Scotch is not that far-fetched. The only reason you're even considering this is because of, of how you feel about her. I'm past that. Positive? You come from two alcoholic parents. Make sure Emily's not your glass of scotch. Emily or Amanda is like a drug to him. He even married a copy of her with Fomanda. So I love those scenes at the end of season 4 when Stevie was the one sole voice to defend Jack. First as his lawyer in the hearing Margot set in motion for retaliation after Daniel's death. Not only is Jack Porter a loving father. He's also a decorated law enforcement officer with lifelong ties to this very county. By the way it is unfair to solely blame David and Amanda for this. Jack was there, too. He could have made another suggestion how to deal with this. He could have called Ben, his partner and have him testify to his advantage. Would not have been the first time that two cops backed themselves up after a murder. In these days this also could have been a statement to police violence. I mean this was clear a case of self-defense. But if you come to the scene without knowing the circumstances around Malcolm Black it looks like someone killed two innocent people. And it had to be either Jack or Emily. So in the end Emily is protecting Jack here as well. Another thing, as I said in my character study of Jack I am torn about his romance with Emily. 
Sometimes I think going with his mother Stevie and leaving the Hamptons for good to live in LA was the best decision he could make. Not only because Emily rejected him again. Since her war with Victoria was not nearly over there was a not so small chance he could be the last collateral damage in this war. And they made us believe after the assassin stabbed him. So leaving all this mess behind with Emily was a healthy decision. But this little girl inside of me with all those romantic dreams and fairy tale romances in mind wants them to ride into the sunset and be as happy as every fairy tale princess and prince can be. Must be the same feeling Stevie had during the wedding, obviously in the time that passed Emily in some kind proved to her that she could make Jack happy. So she did not ruin their wedding by trying to talk Jack, Emily or both of them out of it. Maybe she sees it like I have come to see the last scene with Jack and Emily literally sailing into sunset. After all she put him through Emily can finally make it up to him. She can at least try to give him a bit of the happiness back he shared with her on the beach and with Fomanda in their short-lived marriage. Jack can do the same and try to repair some wounds and scars Amanda collected all those years. Plus if it is true that she cannot have children. With him and baby Carl she can be a family. And who knows with her past as a foster child, they maybe adopt one or more children. Since both have to find a new profession after this rollercoaster during her revenge ender they will need Stevie on their side. So remember my statement from the beginning, it seems as if all three are there to restore all faith in a revenge-free and healthy relationship of mother and son, father and mother. Last but not least mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. At last some few thoughts about differences and similarities between these four mothers. What they all connect is undoubtedly their failures in the past. Every woman left a child behind, some of them even mistreated one or more of their children. For Victoria and her mother Marion Harper it is not unusual that a child who was misused later misuses his own children. Yet a big difference is how all these four mothers cope with their failures and mistreatment from the past. Victoria obviously fails in trying to break the cycle of misuse and unhappiness. I know you think I was a horrible mother. I loved you mother so much that I took the fall for the murder that you committed hoping that one day you would love me back. I heard about Daniel, that Charlotte is in rehab again. Your bastard who abandoned you, just like you abandoned him. So now you tell me, Victoria, who was the better mother? You are a cruel, loathsome bitch who deserves to burn in hell. We'll continue this conversation there. The same can be said for Kara Clark. Sadly she has not the strength to fight her demons and cannot even be there for her grown-up daughter and grandchild. My mother. Nothing ever worked for her. What hope is there for me? Still she has a legitimate reason for her behavior. Because schizophrenia is a real bad mental illness. And maybe it is best that she tries to stay away for Amanda's safety. Yes you can keep it in check with pills. But under those circumstances Emily and Fomanda living in season 2 and the threat with the Graysons and the initiative Kara is just a great risk for the daughter's safety. And she is in danger, too. It would have been easy for the any one of Emily's enemies to arrange some kind of accident. So Kara is keeping herself and her daughter safe by keeping her distance. Victoria has to make a similar decision with Patrick when she realizes that the Hamptons and the Grayson family are an unhealthy environment for her firstborn son. And he is better off without her. In a way this is the only selfless decision Victoria has ever made. Daniel would have become a far better man and maybe even was alive today if she had granted him the same treatment. Cause the bad influence she and Conrad had on both of their children was just huge. The only mother who breaks the cycle seems to be Stevie. Cause in those scenes with her and Jack in LA they seem quite happy. It is a good and healthy choice that both do not intend to make it up for all those years of separation. They just live in the now and try to enjoy what they have with her grandchild Carl. And again Stevie had a better reason to leave baby Jack than Victoria. While she was selfish and left her baby because of the opportunity to study abroad in Paris. I, I got the scholarship. Your flight to Paris is next week. There's only one ticket. Well, because there's only one scholarship. But I can't just leave Patrick. The kid's parents will find another nanny. Stevie had issues that went beyond a simple teenage pregnancy. I was actually trying to protect you from who I was then. I was in rehab. For the first time when I found out I was pregnant, I realized I couldn't be a decent mother until I learned how to take care of myself, which took longer than I expected. Like Kara, she had to fight with health problems as her alcoholism. So it was wise to take care of herself first until she was stable enough to take care of a child. Too bad that both women never tried before to come back into their children's life. 
For Kara it was harder because she still has to fight her mental disorder every day and on top of that came the David Clark scandal. But Stevie who made a name for herself and got a reputation. Obviously being clean and healthy enough to work again as a lawyer she could have tried. Especially after Carl Porter Sr. died and Jack lost his brother Declan. And was she not curious about her grandchild? I mean if she kept taps on Jack she must have known all that. She could have been a real support for Jack after his wife died. That isolation he felt in the time he was deceived by his closest friends Nolan and Emily. Maybe Stevie could have helped him to see clearer. Anyway she came back for him when she did and it seems as if there is nothing that could stand between this reunited family. What do you think about the mothers of revenge? Were Marion and Victoria Harper just monsters who never should have had children? And what about Cara Clark? Could she have redeemed herself by caring for Amanda when she came back in season 2? Is Stevie really that annoying character or did you root for her and Jack like I did? Let me know in the comments below.